Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of The Risk Matrix with myself, Dr. Martin, and James Junkin. Hello, James. Roll Tide, everybody. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Here we are again. Um, we got a new topic to discuss today. Uh, we're going to discuss programmed inspections by OSHA. This has come up recently um, with a couple of our clients, your clients and my clients, OSHA stopping by for various reasons or for no reason at all. And so I thought we'd probably talk about this. This actually was your idea. So before we do that, though, James, we are powered by Veriforce, but we're sponsored by our newest hub partner, Comvoy. Looking for an ideal work truck? Van or SUV convoy can make the process of finding your next vehicle easy and efficient. Convoy is revolutionizing the way businesses find and purchase commercial vehicles. Their mission is to simplify the process by providing access to Convoy's network mm -hmm. of over 1,100 dealerships nationwide. To learn how Convoy's one-stop shop can further assist Veriforce Network members with even greater discounts, visit veriforcenetwork.com slash offer slash discover dash your dash perfect dash work dash truck dash convoy. That's a mouthful. If you, you need to hear that again, that's veriforcenetwork.com slash offers slash discover dash your dash perfect dash work dash truck dash convoy there you Man, go james i'm excited about that Roll time. i i just got uh a 6.7 liter twin turbo power stroke ford f-250 super duty king ranch edition fx4 off-road package named frank from convoy no not from convoy but i'm gonna check convoy out next time because these trucks these, these trucks are a huge expense you know, no, I mean, you, you travel miles and miles and miles in your truck. Love my truck. My daddy would roll over in his grave if he knew what you what were driving I paid for a pickup truck. <laughs> You're driving his house plus some, right? Yeah, absolutely. His house and about 25 cows. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there you go. Anyway. Let's talk about let's talk about our topic today. Well, you know, I'm excited about our topic today about understanding OSHA's programmed inspections. And and I don't want to always come off that that I'm against OSHA, man. I, I, I love the OSHA Act. I love bringing workers home safe from high hazard jobs, which is Veriforce's mission. OSHA has played a critical role in that. I mean, we're lamenting where we are today with regards to workplace injuries and workplace fatalities. But if you look at the historic record uh, from before there was an OSHA, before there was an OSHA Act, mm -hmm. man, it was horrendous. It really was. Mm -hmm. um, it really was. Super dangerous Agreed. to come out and to, to work in the work in the, uh, in the workplaces of America. So a lot of times uh, in our practice, um, we see OSHA post-incident, um, post-fatality, you know, yep. and there's a very intensive investigation that goes on. But there's another side of the inspection process that often goes undiscovered and unrealized because OSHA is so busy inspecting post-incidents that we forget that they have programmed inspections too. So just because you're doing everything right, if you want to use that terminology, doesn't mean that you might not run into OSHA through some of their programmed inspections. That's right. That's right. So OSHA inspectors, um, you know, they 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 have a full time job. They're just not waiting for people to get injured and and whatever. They're looking at focus areas, um, you know, the, the emphasis areas that that OSHA may think that there are more uh, injuries and, and, and the fatalities going on. They might be looking for that at certain work sites. So, um, can you lead us in James with, with, yeah, with I programmed mean, inspections, kind of like how they, how do, how do they decide? Well, they're, they're specifically designed to address from a systematic standpoint, you know, high risk industries mm -hmm. or industries that have an historic higher injury rate than others. So, you know, we talk about OSHA 300 logs a lot, and that data is now being submitted to OSHA electronically in many cases. They use that information to see 
you know, what industry should we target in for program inspections because they're, they're super high risk or we're seeing on the OSHA 300 logs that are being submitted to us upticks and it, it statistically looks like there's been an increase in those industries. So, um, you know, the ultimate goal of OSHA is to minimize workplace hazards, right? The hazards that people are being exposed to and lower these incident rates. That's their goal, protect the worker. They have the same goal you and I have that Verforce has, which is to bring workers home safe from high hazard jobs. So one of the things OSHA likes to do is in program inspections is to identify these hazards and make sure that there are proper controls in place within their regulatory framework, right? OSHA can only cite against a standard, not against a best practice, not against something that is not incorporated by reference from ANSI or, or any of these important industry groups that put forth consensus standards, et cetera. That's a whole nother episode there about consensus standards, but they're there to enforce the regulations, right? So the idea is in a program inspection that we're going to address this before an incident occurs. It's a proactive approach to enforcement to identify hazards and make sure companies are complying with the proper controls in order to reduce the frequency and severity of workplace injuries and illnesses. That's the so first let me, let me break this down, right? So we're, we're OSHA is basically looking for higher likelihood of serious hazards and violations, right? right? So they're looking for industry-specific hazards. They're looking at past inspection history. They're looking at complaints and referrals. Um, they're looking at emphasis plans, local, local and national, because they're different, right? They they can they can be the same or they can be different. And they also use a internal risk assessment process to to look at program inspections. They they look at um, what potential hazards at specific workplaces might be an issue. Absolutely. So, you know, part of this is an enforcement mechanism. Another part of this is an awareness mechanism. So we, I hate to use the word complacence, but safety management systems are not static. You know, they're just not. You're either drifting into greater continuous improvement or you're drifting away from the desired plan, right? And I've been involved in both and I've been guilty of both, right? You can get comfortable in your safety management right. system because you right. haven't had injuries. And look, OSHA citations, we're all conditioned that workplace injuries are a barometer of a company's safety management system health. And that's simply not the case, right? Right, So right. programmed inspections can catch you by surprise because you haven't had a bunch of injuries, you think the, the plane is flying along at 35,000 feet, the engines sound good, we're all comfortable, we just had our meal, the movie's fixed to come on, and the next thing you know, we're descending down to 20,000 feet, the oxygen mask is falling out of the overhead, we're putting ours on before we help somebody with us, you know, it happens like that, right? So, part of this is to get ahead of those instances, those type of things, right? Uh, by enhancing compliance uh, awareness right. and being proactive in your safety management system. The other thing that this does, uh, which is often unstated, is these program inspections can help contribute to economic stability, right? So yeah. if I'm always on my guard because I never know when OSHA may come out there, then I have a more compliant management system. I have less injuries and therefore I have less workers' compensation claims, therefore I have greater economic stability. So my grandmother used to say it like this, some people find religion because they see the light, and some people find it because they feel the heat. This is the heat. This is the heat. A program inspections is the heat, right? So, <laughs> you know, just, I don't know if that's funny or not, but that's Yeah, what, I, 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 listen, I mean, I like, I think a, a good way to look at this, right, is is OSHA is looking kind of at the data, I, I would say, right? Very By, and, and they they use that to pick certain emphasis areas that that are 
you know, either bad actors, right. And that have, that have lots of places that are having violations. I mean, I can, I can make a, a statement that recently they had a warehouse uh, or and maybe they still do have a warehouse national emphasis program. And as we know, there are a lot of big companies um, that, have warehouses and they're having lots of injuries in these warehouses. They're having heat illness issues. They're having uh, ergonomic issues. So um, they look at the data and they, they say, okay, the we're going to go out and we're going to audit these people. You know, workplaces where hazards are most prevalent, right? So it's not always what you would consider to be a high risk industry. For a while, they were targeting retail and right. they were, they were hammering, um, big box retail outlets for violations related to, you know, blocking emergency exits, workplace violence prevention programs, ergonomics, uh, ergonomics, yeah. things of that nature. So how do you get on the list? Well, let's start with that. You know, that's going to be based on industry classification. So if you're right. listening to this and you're in construction, you're on the, you're on the list. list. If you're in the oil and gas industry, you're on the program list. Why? Because those industries are inherently more dangerous due to the nature of their work processes, right? right. So right. you're going to be on that on, on that target. And uh, OSHA uh, in, in this administration that's in uh, the White House now has been well-funded. They've hired more compliance officers, and there are certainly more programmed inspections than in previous years. In previous years, right. they still had program inspections, but they didn't have the resources always to go out and fulfill all these different program inspection lists that they have because they were chasing serious injuries and fatalities all over. So now they're trying to get more proactive. So if you're in an industry, manufacturing, oil and gas, construction, even agriculture, because of the risk nature and profiles of those businesses, you know, due to the nature of your work processes or the equipment you use or the environmental conditions you work in, i.e. OSHA's heat standard that they're trying yeah. to put out right, you're probably going to be on the program inspection list. So let, let me just say this. We just had an episode on the top 10 OSHA violations it comes out every year, right? So you're already on the list. OK, and um, in construction or you're already on the list in oil and gas or, or manufacturing. And then the top 10 list comes out and we have data that says falls in construction are. High number on the list, one. right? Number one, number one. Right. So you're on the list already and now you're doing big projects where fall fall hazards are pre present. Guess what? You're higher on the list. Absolutely. Okay. And then, and then couple that if you've had past inspections or referrals or complaints, you're higher on the list, right? So this is a data-driven solution that they, that they kind of look at um, to target special hazards, special industries, things that are coupled together to make things a higher, higher likelihood. Um, and, you know, don't forget that sometimes OSHA can drive around and if they see something. See, but particularly, and I want to transition, if it's a national emphasis program. Okay. If mm -hmm. it's a national emphasis program. There was a powered be, industrial truck program. You know. And we had a powered we'll, industrial truck. We'll get into some of these that are active right now uh, as far as the national emphasis program. But if you're performing an activity, uh, that's part of the NEP that's out there. They're going to require you, the compliance officer, to pull in and conduct an inspection. And if they see from the road people working on roofs, for example, that don't have right. fall protection, and, and when we say that, most of the time we have this residential view of that, right? They're in a residential yep. area, driver. Hey, there's a lot of work done on flat roofs in commercial with HVAC work. Uh, solar panel uh, stuff that's going in. You know, there's a lot of work going on people's roofs. So I, that, see, I see it all the time. I sent you a picture this week, right? You did. you did. So let's talk a little bit about the National Emphasis Program. Uh, this one's been out there for a few years, and it's the Respirable Crystalline Silica Standard. 
right? So if you're working in construction, in concrete or masonry, particularly in one of these high incident rate, high hazard industries like construction or oil and gas, where we use silica uh, down hole sometimes in the fracking operations, that NEP is targeting you. Where there is a risk of exposure to workers, you will most likely be on a program list uh, in that OSHA area office based on the work that you're performing, right? And we all understand what's going on with crystalline silica, but that that standard, I think it's 2014 when it came out. I can't remember. I, I did, I might had some, I had some James did Junkin. a lot of training on, on silica back then. Mm -hmm. I had some James Junkin comments on the proposed standard, right? They they did yep. not get incorporated. But that standard, you know, those tables are important. Medical surveillance is important. That's a key portion right. of that standard. So, you know, that that that's one of the top ones. Here's another one that we've forgotten about, but it's still there. COVID-19. 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 You know, all of us were kind of tired of the pandemic and shelter in place and stay at home and mask and all that other stuff. But OSHA still has a national emphasis program related to COVID-19 in which it focuses on workplaces where employees are at a higher risk of COVID-19, including healthcare settings, right? Right. And facilities that provide essential services. So that gives you a greater likelihood than the general public to come into contact with the virus. So don't forget about it. You still have a responsibility for protecting your workers. Here's now one. I would, Go ahead. I would, I would say that that um, safety professionals should be, and business owners should be looking at these national emphasis programs and keying some of their safety management system to address potential hazards um, proactively, right? I mean, I just did a search for national emphasis programs. And, you know, I mean, I can tell you right now, I would say, I would say, oh, well, that happens all the time. But, but it also tells me that I need to focus on uh, amputations, falls, heat illness, heat illness. That's a big one. Yeah. Hazardous materials and construction safety. That's what I've got for national emphasis programs that are ongoing, in addition to what you just mentioned, COVID 19. So now I know they have another one uh, related to amputation hazard. So, you know, right now, every safety professional out there is dealing with this concept of serious injuries and fatalities, focus on the sticky, you know, uh, what things right. can we put in place? You know, and I'm going to say it again. It just depends, which is your phrase, but <laughs> hazards are best controlled in planning planning, right? Planning. In design phase of the work. In design phase of the work. So if you're serious about getting your workers home safe and you want to really focus on those activities that are that are seriously hurting people and killing people, look at OSHA's top 10 that we talked about in the last episode and look at these national emphasis programs. Like, for example, there are two that go together, hazardous machinery and equipment coupled with the amputation NEP, okay? If your facility, your job task has a higher potential of amputations or your industry classification code, they see from the BLS data coming in that shows that your industry, the one you're in, has a higher instant rate of amputations, you're going to be on a programmed inspection list, right? Um, Trenching and excavation. The trenching and excavation NEP has been out forever. You can't hide a trenching and excavation operation inside a facility. It's going to be out in the open, right? That's right. People don't be able to observe it. Uh, compliance officers have told me they've been instructed if they go by and they see a trenching and excavation operation ongoing, they are to stop and conduct an inspection. Mm -hmm. okay. How about how about scaffolding, James? Same thing. I mean, Same I think that out here on the East Coast, scaffolding is a local emphasis program. And and compliance officers are probably doing the same thing. You see some scaffolding. Um, a lot of times scaffolding is a big hazard because it's improperly erected. 
right? And then and then we lead to number one, falls. Falls, and we're back to the OSHA top ten. You know, one right. that that gets forgotten about a lot is combustible dust. You know, there's an NEP on combustible dust. Why? Because we blow places up with combustible dust. Down. We're here, not just talking. We're not just talking wood dust. No, down here. Uh, we have probably the largest sugar refinery in the world. It, Domino Sugar is in Chalmette, Louisiana, about six miles from the French Quarter, right? And all that sugar is a combustible dust. Um, so if you're a food manufacturing uh, facility uh, or involved That's in food issue. production, that could be you could be part of the National Emphasis Program. Certainly chemical manufacturing. And anything to do with metal processing, that dust. Shavings, dust. Mm -hmm. yep. Can lead to fires and explosions. So uh, maybe this is off topic, Jane. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, programmed inspections, OSHA stops by. Mm -hmm. What in your, when, in your professional opinion, what, what usually happens in those programmed inspections? How do they introduce themselves and how do they, how do they go about um, inspecting a job site? So whether it's a programmed inspection, whether it's a referral, whether it's a complaint, they have to follow the field operations manual for conducting these type of inspections. There are rules that the compliance officers that come out have to follow. The key is being prepared. See, even in a serious injury or fatality, you've got a little bit of time to prepare. In a, in a serious injury that results in the hospitalization of a worker, you have 24 hours to call that in, right? And so you've got time from the time of the incident to get prepared. You have eight hours to call that in and you have, to, in a fatality, you have time to get prepared. Now, once you call it in at eight hours, it's very rare they show up on the next 30 minutes, right? So you've got some time from the time you notify OSHA to prepare. In a programmed inspection, it's knock, knock, knock. Preparation is your safety, safety management system. It's yeah. everything you do for safety beforehand. So you, you've got to be prepared for them to just walk out on your job site. So what I recommend for companies to do is you need to have a plan. You need to have a policy of what we do, whether it's OSHA or anyone else that shows up on the job site, how are we going to react, right? right. Nobody likes to get inspected. We understand that. But who is going to talk to the compliance officer? And we did an entire episode. I can't remember the episode number, but if you scroll down our list, uh, we did some together, and then we brought in Brent Kettlecamp of Ogletree and Deacons, who's an attorney, uh, deals with labor law and particularly these OSHA inspections. You have to have a plan on what you're going to do. Like, who do I call? Who on site calls? Who do they call to get the OSHA 300 law? Because they're going to see those, right? Yeah. Where are our policies and procedures related to this? How are we going to go in back and, uh, and giving documentation to OSHA. If they ask for train records, things of that nature, you need to have a plan in place. Too late to draw it up in the dirt, right? So so let, let me say this. I'm sorry to take you down this rabbit hole, right? But but for a programmed inspection, right? We're really not in the in the thing where, where something has happened, right? No. Something might be happening, work, right? And the best preparation for that is preparation right yeah. is is actual tuning your safety management system doing internal audits maybe bringing in an outside outside inspector once in a while and being vigilant about each and every high hazard task you're doing and the low hazard ha tasks too but but really what they're emphasizing is high hazard activities absolutely and if you're serious as a safety professional about implementing PCF in SIF reduction programs, then be inspection ready. Be inspection ready. Because that's what they're coming to do. They're coming to inspect to make sure you're protecting your workers against the hazards in these high risk, high incident industries, right? But you're Active not safety. any notification. 
There's no notification. So when they show up, the first thing you're going to have is an opening conference. And the compliance officer is going to tell you why he or she is there, uh, what the inspection is about, what's the purpose, what's the scope of the inspection, and the procedures to use in the inspection. Now, time will not allow in this particular episode to go through everything that you need to do as far as how to manage an inspection in process, right? As far as tips for um, right. notes you should take and documents you should get together and pictures you should take and all those other things. But they'll follow the same process they do in any other inspection. So there's an opening conference. Then there's a, what they call a walk around, which is in, in right. simple terms is a work site examination, right? So they're, if it's out in the open and they're there because you have a high, you're Risk in an industry activity, that like has a falls, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're going to go look and see what's going on related to your fall protection plan. If they're there because you're doing trenching and excavation, they're going straight to trenching and excavation. Now, everything else is fair game. That's right. If I'm going to look at trenching and investiga investigation, and I've got somebody working the loft tied off with a garden hose. You're getting sighted, okay? Just, just know I mean, that. I don't, I don't mean to laugh, but, but it's true, right? The inspector is there to look for for obvious hazards, um, emphasis hazards, uh, special industry concerns. They're they're, they're there to inspect you. So you know, I mean, uh, again, I'm going back to the preparation, right? You should be inspecting your own job sites and be vigilant about the work that you're doing um, and, and complying with the regulations. So if, I, if I'm operating a manufacturing facility or any facility that has equipment in it that has a high incidence rate uh, of related to amputations, you better believe they're going to send a compliance officer that understands machine guarding. And they're going to go right, right to the machines. They're going to look at the machines. Uh, so here's, here's one of my recommendations. If you are in these industries where you know there's a national emphasis program and your industry has a high, higher injury rate or higher risk than other industries, you need to prepare to be inspected on that. So that means if I'm working with machine guarding and I have a lot of machines, I need somebody to conduct a machine guarding assessment, right? They're going to go to those machines. They're going to look at them. And if they're pretty common machines that are not custom built, they've probably seen this thing before. They, they've they got the manual, man. They know how it was That's supposed right. to be assembled. They're like, this picture don't look like this picture, right? Uh, so, you know, equipment examination, sampling, noise sampling, um, this heat standard is is going to be one if, if, it, if it passes and, and get, gets through all the court challenges that may come. That's going to yep. be one where... You better be prepared to take some samples the same time the compliance officer takes samples. That's right. That's temperature, that's humidity, things of that nature. And have a policy and have a program and have, have a procedure that you're following every day. So let's talk about some outcomes and implications of, you know, implications of a programmed inspection. Sure. We're flying along 35,000 feet. Everything's cool. And then we start getting inspected. Citations and fines, penalties can come from these inspections. Okay. And we've talked about extensively, it's not just the monetary. It's not just the monetary. That, it is the reputational. It is how you're viewed by your hiring clients. If you're a contractor, you know, if, if violates how you pre qualify, how you pre qualify to get new work, right? So OSHA issues citations and, and, and penalties and that severity of those depends upon um, a lot of different factors like the gravity of, of the violation, potential exposure to workers, you know, where there is, uh, we just had this one the other day, Dr. Martin, and I love this. There can be a hazard, but where there is no exposure, there is no risk, right? That's right. Uh, but if you found to be in violation, you have to have a plan of abatement. Mm -hmm. Got to know how you're going to fix it. Remember, mitigation is cheaper than abatement. 
Yeah. Be always. swift too in your corrective action. Swift in your corrective actions. Like I always tell companies, if we know, because they're going to tell us at the closing conference, usually the compliance officer is going to tell you in the closing conference where he or she is going and what they found. Don't wait till you get the folded up. Well, they don't fold it. It comes in a manila envelope and it's not folded. But don't wait till you get the certified mail from the OSHA area director to start fixing things. It's, right. it's always good to go into the informal conference having already abated whatever issues there were, right? Now, right. the abatement, the follow-up, that's a whole nother episode about the uh, how we get to that, right? But the closing conference where you're going to get a lot of information. Consulting services of OSHA. OSHA provides consultation services in the proactive. So if you know that you're on the list because your industry is high risk, and, 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 and you're struggling, get the consultation program to come out and get the compliance officer. Uh, well, not, not the compliance help officer, you. a whole different part of OSHA, right? Yep. Get OSHA to get involved and help you. They're really good at that. The consultation there, services are there to be proactive. And if you're in the consultation, they cannot cite you. Right? Good so, advice. You know, Good advice, James. I so, did. I mean, I think, I think, uh, you know, we, we've, we've done a good job talking about like what emphasis, what emphasis programs are out there, what, what program inspection um, involves. I think, I think the gist here is uh, be prepared, right? Be, prepared. be proactive. You want, to bring, you want to bring workers home safe. You're serious about CIF and PCIF and all this that's out there right now. Hey, be ready for your program inspection. Focus on the things OSHA is focusing on because from the data, that's what's killing and injuring workers in your industry. That's right. That's right. Be prepared. So, uh, James, that's another good episode for us. What What do they do if they like what we what, like what we talk about? Man, if, if you like what we talk about, I got a bunch of suggestions. Number one, these episodes are posted by Veriforce and reposted by Dr. Martin and myself on LinkedIn every Tuesday. Right. Hit that like button on LinkedIn and share it with your friends. Or go on over to Veriforce's um, YouTube, YouTube channel where the whole library from episode one, we're in the 60s now, from episode one exists. Hit I still can't like believe we're, we're going strong, James. I, can't I still can't believe it. I can't either. I want them to hit that like button, okay? Smash, smash, man, smash the subscribe button. There on the Vera Force's YouTube channel and Spotify. Spotify. We're on Spotify. The Risk Matrix is on Spotify. You can go there, you can like, and you can subscribe. And every Tuesday around noontime, an episode will drop and, and download to your phone or your device, wherever you listen to, to, listen to it, and you can listen to us. Uh, talk about these important things uh, related to risk, safety, um, procurement, uh, all kinds of things uh, that will help you be a better professional. Absolutely. So subscribe. That way you get the notification. You know when the next episode drops. If you're just now tuning in to the risk matrix, we got a whole library you can go back and listen to. Go back and listen. Absolutely. All right. So Thank you again for listening to another episode of The Risk Matrix with James. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Myself. And keep on bringing workers home safe from high hazard jobs. Out.